This is Duke University. Actually, we just heard uh, from Tom that uh, a central bank, something like the Federal Reserve, is very much the archetype of an independent agency. That's what everybody thinks of when they think of an independent agency. The US uh, was an early adopter of independent agencies in financial regulation. Uh, but, uh, so, the, uh, of course, the Fed dates from uh, the early 20th century, and then by the New Deal, we had uh, very, uh, many other uh, independent financial regulators. Most other developed countries followed by the mid-90s. So from the mid-90s onwards, this was actually the conventional paradigm. And it was propagated internationally by various international organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, as the golden standard for financial regulation. Well, what I'm going to be arguing today is that this conventional paradigm is under attack. So the 2007-2008 crisis prompted a redesign of the architecture of financial regulation. And in this redesign, new powers have gone to elected politicians or their appointees. And I'll show this general trend by uh, pr uh, presenting the results of a multi-country study that shows that this is going on in uh, many other countries beyond the US. So an overview of my presentation, I'll first uh, talk about the theoretical <laughs> expectations of how we uh, expect agencies, independent agencies, to behave, and then how we expect political decision makers to behave. Uh, I'll introduce briefly my data and uh, methodology, and then I'll talk about my findings, and I'll split that into two panels. So uh, in this panel, I'll talk about the main shift from agency independence to politics. <laughs> and then in the uh, next panel, I'll talk about the qualitative characteristics of these reforms across countries, which uh, tie more with the theme of that second panel. So be there as well. Uh, and uh, finally, I'll, I'll end my presentation for this panel with a discussion of what should we make of these reforms? How do we expect them uh, to play out? What can we hope uh, for this political decision makers to achieve? And what are the risks associated uh, with their uh, presence there? Okay, so why did we have independent financial regulations to begin, uh, regulators to begin with? So the, the traditional uh, justification of agency expertise applies actually very well in banking because banking is a, uh, an issue of very highly technical nature. You need to know a lot about how the market works in order to actually regulate them and therefore you need uh, experts uh, running the show. And then the second key justification uh, for agency dependence has been uh, as an effort to address problems as arising from time inconsistency. That means that um, uh, politicians tend to prioritize short-term goals that have electoral gains over long-term goals, and uh, that, um, uh, and also to introduce different, uh, to treat differently different people, whereas independent regulators can actually follow the same approach and can overcome these uh, short-term horizon uh, issues that arise from the electoral circle. Now, what are the risks associated with having independent agencies in finance? So um, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm up applying uh, general theories of what are the risks of independent decision making, independent agency decision making in financial regulation. So various ideas, um, m many people are afraid that independent agencies may be subject to regulatory capture. And in um, uh, finance, this would mean that you could have banks buy, try to buy regulation in, or, in order to formulate it to their advantage. And what we know is that banks, by definition, have a lot of money. So this might be a high risk in, in the sector. Now, a second uh, set of concerns has to do with how these regulators come to form their opinions. How do they uh, come up with their ideas? And there are uh, various, um, there's a, a strand in the literature that talks about the revolving door phenomenon, people coming in and out of independent agencies, and how they become uh, socialized into um, the industry's perspective, how they come from the industry and go back to work for the industry <coughs> after they leave the independent agency. 
And the risk with that in banking is that regulation becomes too lax. It becomes too close to the industry's perspective. And therefore, it doesn't, uh, the, the result of it is that banks actually end up doing things that they're not supposed to do, perhaps undertaking too much risk, which they're not supposed to be doing. Now, uh, all this must be leading you to, uh, must, must have been making you think of uh, concerns arising around the time of the financial crisis. What I wanted to point here is that both these narratives, both the kind of the, quid pro, the, the narrative of the regulatory capture, which suggests some sort of a quid pro quo, uh, an exchange between regulators and the industry, and the socialization narrative, uh, point to this idea that regulation tends to be uh, too lax or too uh, very favorable to the industry, which in the context of financial stability means too many bailouts. And this, was, this is um, the main concern. It doesn't mean, I don't mean to say that there's no possibility for regulators making a mistake, but uh, most of the concerns in the literature tend to lead to this prediction for too many bailouts. Now, uh, why would politicians, what sort of difference do we expect politicians to make? Well, the major, the key idea is that politicians, uh, by uh, acquiring powers in financial regulation, they can increase democratic accountability. They can bring into the picture a set of other constituents which have other sets of concerns and therefore broaden the um, uh, considerations that uh, play a role in reaching financial decisions. Now, the reason I put this slide right next to the previous one is that this actually follows the narrative of, in, of uh, industry capture. So if you think that the problem with independent regulators is that they become too friendly to the industry, well then, by increasing democratic accountability, you have the opportunity of broadening the um, uh, considerations that take place in reaching a decision and therefore having people besides the industry actually play a role in decision making. So that's the substantive element. And there's also a procedural element, which is that democratic accountability increases legitimacy. So the, the decisions that these political decision makers were rich uh, will actually have um, the, uh, the mark of the democratic electoral process and therefore more approval um, from uh, voters. Now, that's one. Uh, justification for granting more powers to politicians. The second justification has to do with what politicians can do by their office. So because they have a much wider set of tools in their disposal, they're responsible for many, many different areas and many different aspects. They can do more <coughs> things that an independent regulator could do. So they can acquire stock participations in companies, it's very hard to imagine the SEC doing that or the Fed doing that. They can exercise pressure on other firms to buy uh, the failing institution. They can relax pressure on the, file, on the failing institution from other perspectives, tax perspectives. So regulators, uh, so, excuse me, politicians in Europe did that very often for failing banks. They delayed uh, tax bills. So all this suggests that there might be advantages to having this political decision makers uh, leading uh, the game. So this is by way of introduction to set the scene for uh, what I'm going to uh, present next. Oh, sorry, forgot that slide. So what are the concerns uh, with, so we, I haven't set the scene yet. I, I need one uh, last. <laughs> Point. So what are the concerns with having uh, politicians in financial regulation? Well, one set of concerns has to do with majoritarianism. This idea uh, that, a ho that um, politicians are supposed to implement the wills of the majority. Well, if you have a very hostile electorate, which pushes politicians to deny um, intervention in the market, uh, this might be might have the effect of them avoiding intervention even when they should uh, 
uh, intervene and therefore lead to a financial catastrophe. Uh, and we know uh, that bailouts are not popular, and we've already heard that there is increasing polarization uh, on both on the left and on the right. I mean, um, Occupy Wall Street and Tea Party don't agree on a lot of things, but they do agree that bailouts are actually pretty bad. One, because they don't like Wall Street, and the other because they don't like government. So whichever way you cut it, they agree on this point, no bailouts. So um, there is another set of risks that is associated with the, um, the fact that politicians have these wide-ranging powers and have this uh, diversity of policy tools in their disposal, which is, well, they can enter into all sorts of bargains and side deals with the industry that have nothing to do with what's going on inside the financial system. They have their own agendas that they want to promote. They have their own political allies that they want to promote. They have uh, campaign contributions that they need to secure. So all this allows for another set of, um, again, considerations and horse trading that has nothing to do with the health of the financial system. Now, I've set the scene, finally. So let me talk about my data and my methodology. So what I did was that I um, focused on developed countries, on reforms introduced in uh, developed countries <laughs> after the financial uh, crisis. And this is the set of countries that I focused on, 15 countries. It includes all uh, the major uh, jurisdictions for financial regulation, <laughs> And together, it would be something like, I don't know, 95% of the world's capitalization, something like that. Uh, what I did was that I asked uh, research assistants to provide uh, memoranda describing uh, the laws in these countries. And what I did was, well, my goal in asking these questions was to track which authority was responsible for some key powers, regulatory powers in this area, before the crisis and after the crisis. So I asked them to complete this set of questions twice. One, so first with the law as it stood in April uh, 2007, so before the crisis had actually erupted and engulfed uh, everything. And then by the end of 2010, when the crisis had mostly abated and most regulators had completed or most uh, national parliaments, I should say, uh, or national legislatures had completed their review of the um, um, uh, of financial laws. Here's a time chart of the reforms uh, plotted against the S&P 500. So you see uh, when barriers happened and then uh, all the countries introducing reforms and most happening after Lehman. Germany is the first because Germany had an intense um, a crisis related to real estate and related to the US subprime collapse. So it was the first receptor of the uh, US crisis in Europe. And then it changed. Um, then you see how uh, the, the pace thickens as after Lima. OK. So after I got all these uh, memoranda, what I tried to do is summarize it in a way that it, I can easily analyze it. So I created an index with 15 key questions, and this is how this index works. So uh, let's say one question, let's say question number two, does the finance <coughs> ministry appoint the majority of prudential authority members? Well, if the answer to that question in 2007 is no, then a country gets uh, a mark of zero, and then if the answer becomes yes by 2010, it becomes a one. So if you add all this for uh, each year, uh, you get a score from one to 15 for each country for 2007 and 2010, right? And this is what I'm finding. So the, the dots show where the score for each country stood in uh, 2007, and the arrows show where it moved by uh, 2010. You see that all the countries that introduced reforms all moved in the same direction, which means increasing political influence from 2007 to 2010. You see that there is significant variation still in where countries stand, right? Um, now, 
the um, most countries okay, that introduced reforms, uh, well, and, and so uh, the most countries that didn't introduce reforms before were already pretty high on that index. There are two countries that stand out, South Korea, which is actually, uh, which was thinking of introducing a reform to the other direction to increase the independence of the financial regulators and stopped. And then Switzerland, which um, of course is a very different system, is a federal system, and uh, the federal council is relatively weak. So what they did was that they created uh, various layers of independent agencies, but no political intervention. So political, so Switzerland is a holdout uh, to this pattern. Okay, so what are my main uh, findings about the uh, qualitative characteristics? As I said, I'll talk about uh, that in greater detail in the next panel, but just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, most of these new powers are direct grants of authority to politicians. So uh, at the Secretary of the Treasury or the Finance Ministry, a minister can take a specific decision uh, rather than appointment and removal powers. They uh, include both emergency operations, so uh, powers to intervene during a moment of crisis, and powers to intervene during uh, prudential um, supervision, so ongoing regular supervision of the banking sector. And uh, they didn't include a lot of reform at the regulatory level, so they didn't abolish or eliminate a lot of regulators, but created new bodies on top of um, existing ones. Okay, now let me uh, come back to um, this discussion. So now that we've seen an overview of how we expect uh, uh, agencies to behave, how we expect politicians to behave, and what are the changes that happen towards more power with politicians, what can we um, make of these reforms? How can we expect them to um, uh, perform in the future? Well, there's two ways to um, think about it. One is to uh, go to the past and see what happened, how politicians performed in earlier crises before, the, um, before uh, independent regulators actually took all these powers. But because in most cases the financial system was very different in the US, you will have to go in the 19th century, it's probably not very, it's not a very good indication of how things would play out in today's much more complicated financial markets. So I think our best guess is to try to come up with some expectations, to look at, the, um, uh, at how they uh, intend to behave ex ante and try to see what are the risks associated with this political decision makers. And the argument I'm, I'm making is that in fact, the decisions that, po that we can expect politicians to reach have, are, very, are very different from one another. So there is much more variance in the, in the possible outcomes of politicians' decision making. And there is variance in many dimensions. One is time. I already mentioned that, that politicians' um, uh, pref, um, decisions show uh, some sort of time inconsistency. That may vary a lot depending on when the crisis appears in connection to the electoral cycle. Imagine the 2008 crisis happened when the, um, uh, the, the incumbent president was not running for re-election, but imagine if the election was happening, uh, if, we, if, if that president was actually running for re-election and the election was due in two months, that we may have had a very different uh, handling of the crisis then. People, um, it, it could be that president, presidents will only want to will always want to bail out because they want no disruption in the um, uh, in the markets. It's a it's a regular finding in the political science literature that incumbent presidents are actually favored by uh, a stable economy. Now, there's also greater um, variability in terms of issue areas. I mentioned the possibility for bargains and side deals. That means that we can expect um, a lot of very different outcomes with politicians at the helm. There is increased, we, we can expect a greater variance in terms of their ideological preferences. 
with um, uh, polarization of views regarding the financial industry. And finally, we can expect greater um, variance because the, the norms in decision making for independent agencies and politicians are very different. Independent agencies, at least in terms of some traditional uh, understandings of how they behave, they have, um, uh, they try to um, realize some sort of professional ideal of that they speak mostly to an audience that is comprised of industry members. And this is the people who they want to, whose approval they seek to gain. Whereas politicians, of course, have to show political acumen to a much wider uh, set of voters. So ex ante, that means that uh, the uh, probability for a good result might come up. It might be higher with politicians, but the, the risks might also be um, uh, much higher. And whether where you end up in this continuum depends on how much you trust politicians. And I like I leave this question to you and to the other two panelists. So our, our next speaker will be uh, Professor Jody Short. Uh, Professor Short is uh, an associate professor of law at the Georgetown Law Center. Uh, this is a return of sorts to Durham, uh, one that Professor Short has made on a few occasions before, uh, since she did her undergraduate degree here, uh, uh, before going on to receive a JD also from Georgetown and a PhD in sociology from UC Berkeley. Uh, her research looks at uh, various dimensions of regulatory governance, uh, particularly mechanisms of re re regulatory delegation to quasi-public and private actors, uh, and the uh, techniques of monitoring those, those actors, uh, the balance between cooperation and coercion uh, as regulatory strategies, uh, and critiques and justifications for regulation, and uh, her paper will continue the, the, the discussion of the role of politics in the regulatory uh, process with a, a, a discussion of the recent turn towards political uh, rationales for administrative decision making. Professor Short. Thank you. Is it okay if I remove the keyboard? Yeah. Is anything weird going to happen? Yeah, actually, uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll see you over there. <laughs> All right, so, um, so, so this paper has a bit of a feel of uh, a rear guard action in the context of, uh, of the rest of the symposium, but, um, but I'd like to think that there's always a place for sort of pushing back against uh, the dominant paradigm. And, um, and, and I'd really like to sort of contextualize my project in that way, um, and you know, in, in particular in, in relation to, to what I'm doing with Catherine's paper. Um, I mean, I, I first want to thank Catherine for, uh, for a, well, first of all, for her generosity in receiving the, uh, the arguments that I'm making in the paper, but, um, but also for, you know, what was in her uh, proposing a place for politics piece, a paper that was truly provocative, I think, in the best sense of the word. And so, um, but, but what, what I don't want to lose sight of, I mean, I, I, I've used it as a, as a jumping off point, but it made me, it, it sort of prompted me to think about all these much bigger issues. And so while I'm looking forward to hearing from her all the ways in which I'm wrong, um, I'm also looking forward to, to prompting a broader discussion about these bigger issues. So, um, so the article arises out of my sense that we're seeing two kinds of shifts in administrative law. The first reconceptualizes the legitimacy of administrative agencies in terms of their accountability to political actors, especially the president, as opposed to um, kind of the traditional, uh, the traditional things that had legitimated administrative agencies, things like expertise or fidelity to statutory commands or their role as fora for robust citizen participation and deliberation. And, um, and the second trend I see seeks to overhaul administrative law doctrine to comport with this rise of presidentialist understandings of administration. Now here I'm addressing recent proposals to adjust arbitrary and capricious review, to give agencies enhanced deference for decisions justified explicitly with valid political reasons. So the immediate goal of the article is to critique these specific administrative law reform proposals not point by point, as others have quite ably done, but as inconsistent with any credible theory of administrative justification. 
But the larger project of the article is to explore how administrative law should respond to political, intellectual, and constitutional trends embracing presidential control as the touchstone of legitimacy for administrative agencies. My intuition is that the answer to this question is not as straightforward as many have assumed. And the article is an attempt to put the brakes on knee-jerk doctrinal reform motivated by you know, what I'd like to characterize as current intellectual fashion. I want to force a more careful consideration of the interests animating both presidential control theory and administrative law before we begin any reconsideration of fundamental doctrinal commitments. Now, the fundamental doctrinal commitment at stake here is administrative law's grounding in reasoned agency decision making. And I make two broad arguments in support of maintaining this commitment as it's embodied in the current doctrinal framework for hard look review and resisting political reason giving. The first is that the practice of political reason giving is unsupported by a coherent theory of administrative justification. And the second is that rational, or um, you know, what I'm sort of characterizing here as non-political reasons, um, serve very important but underappreciated social functions that would be undermined by political reason giving. Okay, so I'll just start with some very basic background on, on reason giving doctrine and administrative law for those of you who are avoiding taking it. Um, agencies uh, must support their actions with reasons. And on arbitrary and capricious review, courts evaluate these reasons to determine if they establish a rational connection between the facts found by the agency and the choice made by the agency. So the prevailing standard of review is provided by State Farm. Um, the, the, it's come to be known as hard look review. And in, very briefly in that doctrinal framework, courts look at whether an agency has considered statutorily permissible factors, whether the agency has considered all important aspects of a given problem, and whether the agency's decision is supported by the evidence before it. Now this has generally been taken to mean that agencies must, must exercise their expertise in the service of making and supporting their policies. And it has sometimes been taken to mean that agencies must provide technical justifications and empirical evidence for their policies. Models of political reason giving purport to keep this general framework intact, but to add to it either an incentive or an imperative to disclose certain political reasons for the agency's action. Um, in both iterations of the model, courts are to give greater deference to agencies' decisions that are justified in what they call legitimate political terms. Okay, now this caveat of legitimacy is very important. The models that have been proposed would not credit just any political reason, but only a valid or legitimate political reason for purposes of enhancing deference. Now, to be valid or legitimate, what they say is that political reasons would have to be public regarding in some way to reflect value preferences or policy calls. By contrast, invalid reasons would be things like crass political horse trading, raw partisanship, or political influence that advances the personal interests of a politician or the narrow agenda of some interest group. So what would a valid political reason look like? Um, well, here I'm just going to steal right out of Catherine's paper two examples of invalid political reasons. First, the president told us to do it, presumably invalid because it doesn't invoke any public regarding value. Also invalid, the president directed us to rescind preemption regulations in order to reward the trial lawyers who provided significant campaign support. Invalid here presumably because it invokes raw politics as the justification for, um, for, the, for the policy. By contrast, a valid reason would look something like this. In justifying its 2009 endangerment finding under the Clean Air Act, EPA might have stated something like this. Our conclusion that carbon dioxide emissions endanger the public health and welfare serves the president's overarching policy goal of protecting the environment and is consistent with the president's foreign policy initiatives, including his promises to foreign leaders that he will work to combat global warming to the extent possible. So presumably this is valid because it invokes the broad purposes of a statutory scheme and situates the president's policy choice in terms of public values that are recognized by the statute. Now, I just want to take a moment to highlight the structure of reason giving under a model like this. 
And what I want you to notice is that it lodges primary responsibility for developing and articulating substantive reasons for administrative action with the president rather than with the administrative agency. In the endangerment example, for instance, the importance of protecting the environment and fostering good foreign relations are justifications offered in the first instance by the president. These reasons are then merely cited by the agency as support for its reliance on the president's authority. The model envisions no independent role for the agency in developing the public regarding values-based reasons for policy. Now, this is a big shift in existing administrative law doctrine um, that I'll talk a little bit more about later. But for now, I, this, is just, this is how I'm defining what a political reason is. It's a citation by the agency to the authority of the president, albeit one based on the good reasons that the president has articulated. And what, what I argue is that all other kinds of reasons can be considered rational in the sense of the you know, sort of conventional reason-giving paradigm. Now, I just wanted to lay all this out because I, I think it's this structure that makes political reasons very difficult to justify theoretically. I think you could ease the burden of justifying them theoretically if you abandoned um, you know, some, of these, uh, some of these properties of political reasons, although they might make them less palatable on other grounds. But, um, but, it, but again, I think it's this general structure that, that makes them a little bit problematic. So in the first part of the paper, I explore what theory of administrative justification might support political reason giving of this type. And um, you know, I mean, there are lo there's lots and lots of talk about what it, what it is that rational reasons are doing, you know, why we have those as part of the administrative process. So I, I'm sort of asking the question, what work is it the political reasons are doing? Uh, proponents of administrative reason giving haven't really focused on this issue of administrative justification, but the, the proposals that, um, that, that I've engaged with here suggest that one of two theoretical frameworks might be driving the models. The first is presidential control theory, and the second is information dis, uh, disclosure. And perhaps ironically, that's possibly with an eye towards undermining presidential control. What I argue in the paper is that neither framework unproblematically supports the practice of political reason giving as it's been proposed. And uh, but what I hope to suggest by this analysis is also that part of the difficulty with these proposals is precisely this lack of a normative thrust. It's very difficult to effectively craft a policy or a doctrine without knowing the precise end toward which it is directed. And, and there's, there, there's just a, there's a lot of play in here. Okay, so first political control theory. Uh, my aim here is not to definitively foreclose the case against uh, presidential control theory, but just to show that it's not an easy case to make, that we can't simply assume, as everyone has, that one flows from the other. And, um, and I, I think that no one's really done the heavy lifting yet to connect the dots between presidential control theory and political reason giving. So I argue that a presidential theory of political reason giving would have to overcome three sets of issues. First, in some circumstances, requiring agencies to provide political reasons for their actions might actually pit the agency against the president. Second, models of political reason giving contemplate courts passing on the legitimacy of discretionary presidential actions. Now, because these models shift the onus to provide legitimate reasons from the agency to the president, they make these reasons, the president's reasons, the object of judicial review. And this creates two sorts of problems. The first is that there are doctrinal hurdles to the judicial review of the president's exercise of statutorily delegated discretion. And the second is that, you know, just sort of beyond that threshold question, it seems just absolutely antithetical to presidential control theory for courts to be making calls about what constitutes a legitimate or an illegitimate reason for a presidential action. Finally, and also contrary to the normative thrust of presidential control theory, models of political reason giving ignore fundamental constitutional separation of powers principle, uh, principles, namely the constitutional role of Congress in creating lower federal courts and defining their jurisdiction. Congress has exercised this constitutionally conferred power in the APA where it specifies that reviewing courts are to, quote, set aside agency action found to be arbitrary, capricious, or an abuse of discretion, or otherwise not in accordance with law. 
Now, proponents of political reason giving certainly don't disavow this standard, but neither do they explain how it is that political reasons for agency action render that action non-arbitrary, as it must in order to be upheld under this standard. In some political reason giving as it's currently conceptualized is arguably incompatible with the presidential control theories in which it purports to ground itself. But perhaps presidential control is not what these theories are after. The more I thought about these models, the more I started wondering that perhaps even though they're dressed up in the rhetoric of presidential control, maybe they're actually meant to be subversive of presidential control. And in this formulation, political reason giving starts to look a lot more like a tool for information forcing, for getting agencies to reveal the true political motivations for their decisions so that we can evaluate not only whether the decisions are lawful, but also whether political influence legitimates them. Now, while this may be a worthy goal, I argue that an information disclosure regime of the type embodied in political reason giving models <clears throat> is unlikely to reveal the information they seek. And there are three parts to this argument. I mean, this is just kind of drawing on standard information disclosure theory. The first is that for a variety of reasons, the information disclosure design of political reason giving is unlikely to change the behavior of information receivers and disclosers in the desired way. That is to make politicians controlling administrative action more politically accountable for their decisions. Second, irrespective of its effects on behavior, political reason giving is unlikely to produce good quality information or to tell us something that is both hidden and true about the administrative process. And finally, I argue that the disclosure of political reasons may have unintended costs. Um, all right, so I shift gears in the next part of the paper. Um, Here's where I, I sort of start thinking, well, if existing theoretical frameworks for understanding administrative justification are inadequate, and, and I actually believe that the great contribution of political reason giving, the, of these political reason giving articles is to demonstrate that they are, then what would an alternative theory of administrative justification look like? And I wanted to try and look at reason giving in, in a different way, not as a palliative for power or a mask hiding the real power behind a decision, but instead as a social practice that constitutes agencies. And specifically, I argue that what I've defined as rational um, you know, or, or non-political reasons, as opposed to political reasons, serve two impor important functions um, in the administrative process. First. It constitutes agencies as particular kinds of organizations, shaping everything from routine staffing decisions to agency culture and the cognitive scripts that guide agency decision-making processes. Second, this sort of rational reason-giving paradigm structures agencies' interactions with other legal institutions. And in both respects, the existing reason-giving framework fundamentally shapes what agencies look like and how they act in ways that the hierarchical structure of political control simply can't replicate. Now, the first part of the theory comes from the observation that whatever else administrator, uh, administrative agencies might be, at base, they're just organizations. And we know from extensive research and organizational theory that the structural design of organizations significantly influences the outcomes that they produce the decisions they make, the goals they set for themselves, whether they're able to, to achieve them. Hard look review has prompted agencies to structure themselves in very particular ways, to develop internal constituencies of professionals committed to scientific, analytical, and reasoned decision making, to give these constituencies some measure of clout within the uh, agency organizations whose decisions must be justified on rational grounds to develop routines that force considerations of the opinions and evidence produced by the agency's professional constituencies. All of this ultimately producing a culture that focuses agencies' attention on policies that will be publicly justifiable in <laughs> rational terms. Um, you know, that sort of defines the, the, the sense of what's possible and desirable for agencies and the actors within them to do. Now, while models of political reason giving purport to preserve rational grounds for justification of administrative action as a doctrinal matter, allowing a deference trump for political reasons would undermine the constituencies within agency organizations who are committed to developing non-political reasons for the agency's action. 
And what I argue is that uh, undermining these constituencies would undermine two important functions that they serve in regularizing agency decisions that I actually don't think can be replicated in a, in a sort of hierarchical political control model. The first function that they serve is that the, this organizational structure of administrative agencies has the salutary effect of constraining and regularizing agency decisions even in the absence of direct oversight by either the president or the judiciary. This kind of intrinsic discipline is of critical importance because the bulk of agency activity takes place outside of the glare of political and judicial spotlights. And so you don't want to structure your agency in a way that, um, you know, where, where people are controlled solely by the orders that they're getting from the top. Second, these organizational structures give agencies or expert constituencies within agencies a means of pushing back against inappropriate exercises of executive power. Now, I know that this is something that both Catherine and Nina are concerned about as well, and they can see that the president cannot direct policy that contradicts statutory mandates or the agency's factual findings. But the problem is these safeguards are hollow in the absence of internal constituencies who are committed to the values of statutory fidelity or scientific integrity and who are also empowered to press their case up the ranks of the agency. And that's what I think that you lose in a political reason-giving paradigm. All right, so the second component of this argument, and I'll just go through this really briefly, um, but this, that agencies are shaped by what I'm characterizing as their social relationships. And um, this sort of arises uh, with other branches of government, and this kind of arises out of a, a synthesis of social interactionist theory and separation of powers theory. So the idea is that the social interactionists see individual behavior shaped and constrained in critical ways by the interactions or the relationships that individuals have with one another. Reason giving is, uh, has been found to be a valuable currency in these interactions, allowing individuals to negotiate their relationships with one another and revealing important information about the status hierarchy in those relationships. Now I see an analogy between interactionist theory at the individual level and the functional theories of separation of powers that see different branches as constantly negotiating, balancing, and calibrating their relationships with one another. I actually, I want to direct you all to Emily, to a piece that Emily has written, or is it coming out or is it out already? The Columbia piece? Okay, it's out. Okay, so Emily has a great piece in uh, Columbia uh, that captures this dynamic nicely. She calls it dialogic judicial review. And uh, I, I go into much more detail in the paper, but the crux of the argument that I make is that political reason giving changes the vocabulary of reason giving in ways that are calculated to kind of cement and realign these relationships in particular ways. Specifically in ways that fix and formalize the relationships between different legal institutions and circumscribe the possibilities for negotiation among them. Now, this might be one possible goal of reason giving, but before adopting it, I think that we, have a, we need to have a much more explicit discussion about the merits of, um, of a more formal approach to separation of powers, because I think that's the direction in which it takes us. Okay, so um, just by way of summary, through the lens of sociological theory, uh, through, this, through the sociological theory of reason giving, uh, the critique of political reason giving models is that they fundamentally misperceive the mechanisms by which agencies are constituted and constrained, as well as the key role that current reason giving practices play in fostering these mechanisms. And, and, you know, one of my issues is that they fail to articulate what might take their place. What would an agency look like in a world of political reason giving? Um, so that's kind of something that I want to push um, proponents to think about. And just, uh, again, a quick coda. My hope in making these arguments is twofold. The first is to slow momentum for renovating fundamental administrative law commitments in the name of presidentialism. And the second is to establish a set of criteria by which administrative law reform proposals should be judged. Administrative law is mediated through the organizational structures that comprise agencies and the social and institutional relationships in which they are embedded. And we should demand that law reform proposals consider how different rules might shape the mechanisms that so deeply influence what agencies look like and how they act. Thank you.
So I, I think that was a proposal for a soft moratorium. <laughs> uh, but we're going to get a chance now for Catherine Watts to uh, engage with some of these ideas as a platform for further discussion more broadly. So Catherine. So in some ways, um, what Jody said is music to my ears because she said she's pushing back on intellectual fashion and pushing back against the dominant paradigm. And I think it's the first time that I felt like I'm not the underdog in pushing this <laughs> argument. Um, ever since publishing my Yale piece, I've, I've faced um, numerous people that have said it's um, extraordinarily bold or radical or, or worse words than that. So it's nice to, to, to feel as if um, that Jody senses that there's some momentum in that direction. Um, the argument that, that I make has been, I think, pretty, made pretty clearly, which is simply that I argue that rather than having a very technocratic focus in terms of how we approach reason giving in administrative law, we should move towards a model in which some legitimate political considerations are viewed as adequate reasons that might factor into the mix. So I don't suggest giving a trump card at all to political reasons, but that political reasons can factor into the mix along with the technocratic reasons to help to justify agency decision making. And my argument was based on four main reasons. I argue, one, that the benefit of this would, that it would be that it would bring greater coherence to administrative law, which currently has this big split, this big divide, tension between expertise-driven models and political-driven models. We see it come out in the Chevron case itself, where on the one hand, deference is justified in terms of expertise, and on the other hand, as well justified in terms of political accountability. Second major reason I see supporting the shift is trying to create a better separation between science and politics. Under the um, George W. Bush administration particularly, we saw numerous allegations that the science was being tainted by the politics. And I think if you give a sphere to each, then you're going to protect those spheres and the unique contributions of those spheres rather than forcing the politics in through the back door because it doesn't have its own appropriate place. Um, the third reason I give in support of the transition would be to soften the ossification charge, this charge that rulemaking is ossified, that arbitrary and capricious review has ossified the rulemaking process. By giving an additional reason for deference, it might make it a bit easier for the rulemaking process to move forward. And then the fourth reason, which is really the central reason, has to do with enabling greater monitoring and transparency of the process to enable political accountability. And that's really um, at the heart of the paper, is trying to align um, reason giving requirements with political accountability. So Professor Short, I think, um, appro appropriately points out that people like me and Nina Mendelssohn who have advocated in favor of a shift towards political reason giving or towards a political model um, have not been perhaps as expressed as we should be about um, the grounding. And so her first main criticism of us is that we don't develop a coherent th theory um, behind the reason giving requirement. So I think there I was um, hopefully implicit, and I thought maybe a little bit more than implicit, um, that I was really resting on the information disclosure um, benefit in terms of the monitoring transparency benefit um, of reason giving. In other words, that reason giving is designed to enable monitoring to facilitate political accountability. So the information disclosure feeds into the political control model because it's through information disclosure, through enabling monitoring, through enabling transparency that we facilitate political control of the regulatory state. So that is, that is really the grounding for my proposal, and I think it is for Nina Mendelssohn's proposal as well, um, reading between the lines of her paper. Um, Professor Short doesn't see information disclosure as sufficient, and she gives many, many reasons why. I'll just touch on a couple of them in terms of my responses. One of them is she says disclosing political reasons in the Federal Register won't be effective because general public doesn't read the Federal Register. I guess I have a couple responses to that. One is if we're using the Federal Register for the rulemaking process as a whole, for all of our notices and all of our final rules, um, if it's really ineffective, then why aren't we thinking about revamping it across the board rather than just, in, why is it problematic just in this, in this one slice? Um, and then the other is that even if the public's not really reading the Federal Register, others are, and they're translating it in a way that the public does understand. So when something's in the Federal Register that is something the public cares about, we then see it splashed across the news in the headlines that are in the newspapers. We see it picked up by blogs in today's highly um, technological world. And so I think um, it, would be, it would be problematic to too quickly dismiss 
the Federal Register as an effective means of disclosure because that is often translated into terms that the public can understand, particularly in light of um, recent electronic developments. Another thing that she says in terms of why she dismisses um, the information disclosure rationale is she says that there's no broad public demand for information. I disagree with this looking at a number of recent um, instances. Look, for example, at congressional hearings that were widely held and that were again splashed across the news because people cared that responded to allegations that the Bush administration had tainted the science or ignored the science, for example, relating to the EPA's national ambient air quality standards. Very rancorous hearings that were very much in the public eye that the public seemed to want and care about in order for them to understand had politics driven the decision. Were politics behind those decisions? That's just one example. I think there's many others that followed in the wake of Massachusetts versus EPA, where the public wanted to know what really happened. Why did OMB refuse to open the email when EPA sent the new draft regulations after Mass v. EPA? Wanted to know about that behind the scenes process. So I do think there actually has been large um, uh, public interest in, in knowing more about what's going on behind the process. A third reason that she gives for dismissing information disclosure is that she says that quality information won't be disclosed without an, a, an effective enforcement mechanism. And this is the point on which I think there's um, the most need for thought in terms of those of us who are supporters of a political, a move towards a political model. It's, it's concerning because if we have no effective enforcement mechanism to make the political reasons come out in the open, then, of course, it's just going to be more of a facade, right, where agencies point to the good reasons and they don't point to the bad reasons. <clears throat> so we likely can't just give agencies a carrot, just an incentive. We probably do have to think about some sticks. I think Nina Mendelssohn has suggested one good stick, which is you have a statute that mandates, um, that mandates disclosure, and, and, and you make it as enforceable as you can, knowing there will always probably be some attempts to ignore the statutory command, but it nonetheless would be a statutory command. That does, as I talk about in my paper, have some um, potential legal hurdles, like executive privilege, but it's something to think about. Another would be, short of a, an amendment to the APA, like Nina Mendelssohn suggests, would be to just rely on the courts to punish agencies where they catch agencies withholding information, where agencies are playing games and not disclosing, they punish them. This could be what happened in State Farm, the famous seatbelt rescission case, where the agency itself didn't talk about the political reason, the fact that the Reagan administration had come in and, and a change in administration had yielded a change in the passive restraint requirements. Um, Rehnquist calls out the fact that that was going on, but the agency doesn't, and so perhaps the court there was really punishing the agency for not fessing up to that. There's other cases where it's been more overt. Um, Tomino versus Torti was a case involving Plan B, the contraceptive Plan B, in which through discovery that was able to be obtained, it became very clear that there was some very bad politics driving the decision there, including um, attempts to um, manipulate confirmation hearings by doing or not doing certain things. Bad politics at play. And that was sniffed out, and the court punished the agency for that. So I think that using um, scenarios where you can get discovery based on bad faith, which is hard to do with agencies, other mechanisms where there is an ability for courts to sniff out and to punish, I think there is room for enforcement mechanisms to be used. But I, I absolutely agree with both Professor McGarrity and Professor Short have pointed out this is an area that we need to think much more about and figure out how we could, um, how we could organize it. So on her second point, just to touch on quickly, her second point is um, that sociological theory in her mind supports a rationalist paradigm rather than a political paradigm. And she uh, makes that argument for two reasons. The first is I understand it related to organizational structure, and the second related to um, hierarchy in terms of legal authority. In terms of her argument about organizational structure, her concern seems to be that she wants to preserve a sphere for the experts, the scientists within the agency. That is a matter of organizational theory that that's a valuable thing to do. Um, my answer there would be to point back to the need to separate science and politics precisely to preserve that sphere. That was a real concern of mine, and that's one of the driving reasons why I actually do advocate moving towards a, a political model, is to give the scientists give the experts within the agency an appropriate role to play so that they do preserve their role within the organizational structure rather than having their organizational role continually subverted and tainted by the politics like we saw, if you believe the allegations, um, in the GW Bush administration. So that's my main response to that point. In terms of the 
um, hierarchy argument that she makes in which she argues that mere citations to code, meaning citation to legal authority, is an insufficient reason from the perspective of organizational theory or, or sociological theory, and that instead she would prefer to require agencies to craft causal explanations for their policies that don't just cite to code. I have two responses to that, two primary responses. One is that I think it's a mistake to think that any time an agency would cite to or would point to the president's views on a subject, that that would, um, that would be the president giving the reasons rather than the agency giving the reasons. We would never say that if an agency points to um, views that a commentator raised, we would never say that the agency was not giving the reasons, but the commentator was giving the reasons. We'd just say that the agency had adopted those reasons that were raised by the commentator. So they become the agency's views. So it's an incorporation by reference, in essence. And I think that's here what would be going on. When you have a citation to presidential authority, the agency is accepting those views and incorporating those views into its decision-making matrix. The other is that I don't think either Nina Mendelssohn or I are, are arguing that mere citation to political authority should suffice. There has to be that causal story. There has to be the causal story that, in the end, ties the decision to values that are embedded in the statute. Because at heart, of course, if reasons are taken into account that are outside the statutory framework, they would be impermissible. Um, so in terms of how I've defined political explanations that would be valid, they generally would rely on a value-laden story um, that I don't believe um, could be characterized as just a mere citation to, to legal code. So those are a few of my main responses. I really thank her for continuing the discussion, and, and, um, and it, 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 it makes me quite pleased that, uh, as I said, that it's something that you feel like is, is gaining some momentum. So thanks for your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I think I'll begin just a, the brief observation about the historical context in which this debate is happening. So, so uh, maybe just begin with a, a brief reminder of, of the historical foundations of this administrative state that we're discussing here today, um, one that came out of a, a sense that one needed to formulate, fashion new kinds of institutions to deal with some very powerful dilemmas associated with modern industrial life. Uh, and that emerged from the late 19th century into the er, uh, early to mid 20th century uh, as very much, at least in the United States, as a bipartisan conversation with, with people from both political parties often uh, supporting and opposing particular ideas and helping to fashion not just particular institutions but broader kinds of methods <laughs> and approaches, as well as uh, a baseline kind of uh, justification for this, this institutional creation uh, that really did emphasize the importance of dispassionate, I want to stress that, dispassionate, in some regards you could say that's what, you can put that within a political framework, but in other ways it's a little more complicated, technical assessment. Um, now the point that Professor Short is making is that this has uh, generated, one point at least, is that this has generated over the decades a particular kind of organizational culture that we have reason to keep. Now, we can certainly debate that question, but I wanted to put that um, front and center here before offering just a couple of questions um, to the panelists. Um, for, uh, for our first uh, presenter, uh, Professor uh, Godinas, I, I, I'm curious what you would see as the explanation for this shift. Um, is it that the stakes have become so high that people see uh, a need to anchor discussions in the overtly political realm? Uh, is it that uh, the apparent record of regulatory failure within at least the realm of financial regulation has led people to question the value of delegation to ostensibly independent technical sorts of people? Um, and why do you think, and the final point would be, why not uh, emulate the position of someone like Steve Crowley in responding to this issue uh, if the problem is there hasn't been enough countervailing voice? Rather than put it front and center in the political process, why not think about what might be necessary to beef up the capacity of other kinds of groups to have a say? Uh, it's really striking during that era of deregulation that uh, there were, you know, we didn't have organizations either in the United States or Europe or Japan that were speaking 
on behalf of the dangers of systemic risk. Now we're getting some, better markets, Americans for financial reform, maybe even um, Occupy Wall Street's uh, initiatives of, of the last several months. Um, for Professor Short, um, I guess I'm also curious about whether you would want to take this even further, uh, whether you would want to make an argument that um, what's at issue here is a loss of popular appreciation for the narrative, the story, of why we have the administrative state in the first place. Um, and, and that if you have that long historical arc, uh, there needs to be, if you, think, if you think the regulatory state has a positive function, and you may not, uh, that the, the place to, to really join the battle is in fundamentally responding to those who are out there on the political domain constantly with the drumbeat of we're overregulated and we have all of our problems are, we need a timeout, all of our problems are, are at the behest of these agencies as opposed to coming up with a, a, a version of a defense of the, of the administrative state that would resonate with the, with the public that likes particular regulations and likes to be protected from particular harms but has a notion that bureaucracy is, is a, 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 a behemoth that, that, that is an, an enormous problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally for Professor Watts, um, if, if the appropriate response to the uh, really quite searching critiques of the regulatory state that have emerged over not just the past decade, but this, this has been, this has been uh, something that has uh, been going on for as long as the administrative state emerged and gained particular force within academia from the 1950s onwards, particularly in economics and political science. Um, if the answer is that we actually need more political accountability, uh, and if the, the, the way to do that is not to bring in more voices into the political process, like someone like Steve Crowley might advocate, but rather to move to political reason giving, uh, why not, and this is echoing, I think, a point from the previous panel, why would we want to allow delegation at all? Rather than assuming that if it's really political, that it's best sorted out within overtly political institutions that are representative in, in their character. So those are, those are my quick responses. Okay. So um, thanks very much for these thoughts, which are very much at the, at, uh, in my mind as I was doing all this, um, uh, all this project. And I tried to get to them, uh, or at least my first attack at what uh, caused this change was to explore um, you know, some usual suspects. So um, dimensions that we associate with political, with uh, um, leg legislative decision making, such as, well, parties in power, whether uh, uh, parties of different ideologies have different responses, uh, whether um, uh, different uh, economic, uh, financial systems, so countries that have a bank-based um, uh, financial system respond differently than countries that have a capital markets-based financial system, whether, um, you know, currency, what kind, what sort of currency you have, whether you're a member of the Eurozone mm -hmm. uh, plays a role. So uh, what you see, I mean, with um, uh, 15 countries, you cannot have a very good indication of that, uh, like, uh, and get to statistical significance, but what you see, at least from a, um, initial spread uh, of the data is that everybody's moving in the same direction. So <laughs> these uh, kind of traditional variables don't work. Uh, now, this kind of points more to your two initial suggestions. One, that the stakes have simply become too high. So if you're dealing in millions and you're an independent agency, you're fine. You know, billions, fine, hundreds of billions pushing it, but still fine. But if you reach over a trillion, you need to just go to the voters because that's too much and people will start complaining. Now, um, this, I, I, I certainly believe that this is part of the explanation. I have to point out uh, that I didn't see a very strong, um, let's say correlation between the level of the, um, of the reform, so the introduction of new powers, or let's say the shift in that index that I created, and the impact of the crisis in that particular country. Uh, so it seems that um, 
I, I think that might have to do with a sense of panic, so that people were not so uh, that were not responding to the um, the the impact of the crisis they were seeing in their country, but they were responding to the fear that something might happen, which was much larger than the actual impact. So perhaps I was using the wrong um, you know measure to count that. Um, and that and Australia is a perfect example of that because all of a sudden, immediately after Lehman, they introduced deposit insurance, which they didn't have before, because everybody in Australia uh, started getting worried that they're going to lose their deposits in Australian banks because Lehman collapsed. Um, so I think that's partly the explanation. And it's not, however, just that the stakes have become uh, really high. It's also that it's, um, it, it's a question that has gained prominence in voters' minds. And this pushes politicians to claim more power over that. Now, whether, and there, there could be two dimensions to that. One is they think that if they, um, they think that there are gains to be made by claiming more power because they, they will uh, cater to interests that their constituents have and therefore uh, gain more electoral support, or, which is the negative side of this, is that they're afraid they will be blamed if they don't do something and if they just leave it to the agencies. Uh, and um, that's another, um, um, another possible motivation. So I'm, I'm, I was trying to think of how to kind of go out there and try to measure all that. And if you have any suggestions, I, I'm, um, uh, you know, I'm glad um, uh, to hear them. Now, um, your second uh, point about regulatory failure. So I definitely think this was part of it, the fact that people um, saw the financial crisis as a result of failings of regulators. But, you know, the 2008 crisis was not really the first crisis that we saw. <laughs> it was the last in a series of crises. And in all the previous crises, the result was exactly the opposite. Increase independence, increase budgets and staff for independent regulators, give more powers to agencies. Mm -hmm. So it was exactly the opposite. So there was something about the 2008 crisis that caused us to rethink this paradigm. So, so per, just quickly on that, yeah. per, perhaps that's because the crises up to 2007 and 8 were in the periphery, and the one when it when it came into the the core. You mean again? So back to the idea that the stakes are too high. Well, not just that, but who's pushing the model? As you point out, the World Bank, the IMF. So if the crisis is in Asia, if it's in Mexico, if it's in Argentina. Well, obviously, oh. you're not following the the prescription yes. properly. Well, now when it when it fails. In, what, in, in New York and in... Well, but what about Enron? What about Sarbanes-Oxley? It was a, a huge expanse of regulatory power uh, for the ICC that everybody was complaining about. And it was also in, uh, in the US, and there was this um, uh, concern that it was actually a crisis very much at the core and um, you know, tarnished the view that the US regulatory uh, ideal for accounting was actually the, um, you know, the golden standard in accounting and allowed, um, well, it said, let's say, it just triggered a set of, a, of a, an additional set of developments. So there's something about this crisis that um, caused people to, to be mindful of independent regulators. I don't know, maybe it was Greenspan. You know, they just thought he would, so it, that, that it, there was just too much industry influence. So, and this kind of points to, uh, kind of gets me to the response to your final point, which is, well, what about other measures uh, of um, introducing monitoring into the financial system that are not political ones, or introduce the voice of other groups into this process, but not exactly um, politicians. So there have been um, um, a set, so the, the kinds of proposal that, I, uh, that I've seen, um, trying to introduce market monitoring mechanisms. So some sort of hybrid bonds uh, issued by banks that allow um, you know, traders to basically monitor the risk that the bank is undertaking. And this is, um, is becoming more, more popular. And now we have you know, hybrid bonds for sovereigns as well. 
Um, but the problem with that is that if you, if, if well, m the press at least interpreted the 2008 failure as a, mar as a failure of the market and of the idea of market efficiency. So if you believe that there's a problem with that, then market mechanisms don't help you uh, very much. So you have to uh, find other, you have to find these other groups that you mentioned, but who, who is there out there? It's um, all, all the people that were monitoring banks so far were market participants. Um, so then you just turn perhaps to the default, which is, well, you know, we have all these complicated problems and we have to solve them somehow, and someone has to decide about that. Now, the president, if he can decide whether, you know, to protect us from a nuclear invasion, then he can decide what to do in a financial crisis. So, uh, you go back to this kind of initial, I guess, theory of majoritarianism. But, um, you know, in order to actually um, <coughs> validate uh, all these points, I have to go and uh, do interviews with many participants and uh, look at the historical record. I have to wait for a couple of years until they are free to speak, I guess, and feel uh, hope, uh, you know, able to share uh, their views. Yeah. So I just want to point out, we're, we're, uh, I assume we have some time to play with because lunch is at noon. Um, so I, I, would you two like to respond quickly or should we... Whatever turn, you guys want to do. Yeah, well, let's turn it to some questions, and then and then you can weave your responses into sure. to, to my comments if you like. Uh, yes. Uh, it's directed to Jody and Catherine. Uh, my own predictive judgment is that judges will react badly when a statute says use best available technology, use best available science, and the agency's lawyer at bar says we got this through politics. Um, doesn't this raise the non-delegation problem fairly squarely? Whatever channelized discretion exists in environmental or labor laws, such as it is, ceases to conscript, constrain the scope of the discretion. And I was thinking about McGarrity's point earlier about red state and blue state maps and the effects of the, uh, environmental regulations based on which states you won or lost. It's hard to see how you can ever fit that into use technology or use science. Second question, uh, isn't the constraint of giving substantive reasons an important check on arbitrary process? And maybe it doesn't work. That's an empirical claim that you're advancing that the substantive reasons are really bogus. Maybe Vermont Yankee is the problem. Maybe that's wrong. And courts should focus on process and not substance. You know, judge Bazelon had the better of the bazelon Leventhal debate. If we can't trust judges to get behind fake reasons that are couched in terms of expertise or health or science, then maybe we should focus on processes that are sufficiently transparent that if the result can be seen as a logical outgrowth of the process, we don't care what motivated the president or the administration. I'm happy to start on the, on the first point. I agree with you completely in terms of if you've got a statute like the Endangered Species Act that says you've got to use the best available science, then po political considerations have been taken off the table. Um, and so I'm very frank about that in, in, in my paper in saying that it's only where the statute is the statutes never say, yes, you may take politics into account, but they sometimes implicitly say, no, you may not, through something like that, like the Endangered Species Act. It's in all those other areas where it doesn't dictate that the decision be based on the best science available, um, where it's just amorphous in terms of the factors that can be considered, or much more amorphous, that there I see a, a role for politics. Um, and your second point, I think, is a very good one. I think it does. I think this whole discussion does push us, perhaps, to think harder about the Basel on Leventhal debate all over again. So it's something I'd like to give a little bit more thought to. I hadn't thought about it that way. I think it's a great question. Um, a, a couple of responses, I guess, just in, in response to Catherine's response. Um, I, you know, I think that she has been very explicit about this and, you know, kind of drawing the boundaries around where you could use political reasons. I think the difficulty with that is in, in a Chevron world, it makes it very difficult to, to draw those boundaries with any sort of clarity. And so you can imagine statutory standards such as the ones that um, Ron is citing becoming very malleable. And um, you know, and, and allowing in you know, kind of the the political considerations that you're talking about potentially for for enhanced deference. So I think that I, I think that it's not a firm boundary so long as you have Chevron, and and it makes it a, a little bit difficult to to maintain. Um, and then in terms of. Um, in terms of evaluating the substance, I mean, I think I, I think that in some way, 
I, I, I guess I haven't lost hope in, um, in the ability to, to do that and the project of doing that. And, and I think that this actually goes to, to Ed's question in a way. Um, this, uh, this, this idea of the loss of popular appreciation for, for narratives of why we have regulation, of why we regulate in given circumstances. And um, I mean, that, that's really a theme that runs throughout my work and a huge concern of mine is trying to recover those narratives in the face of you know, what have become very politicized narratives about why we regulate or why we shouldn't regulate. And I think that, that these sort of rational, what I'm calling rational justifications for regulation are really one of the last <coughs> remaining artifacts of, of that old narrative about why we regulate. And I think my big worry, you know, I mean, I think that Catherine had really good responses to, to you know, to sort of a lot of the, a lot of the kind of points along the way in my argument. But I think for me, the crux of it, and this may be an empirical question that I'm just wrong about, but, but my fear is that there, there would be a crowding out effect if you allow political reasons into the judicial review process. Process, uh, by by crediting them by uh, by by rewarding agencies for um, for for their good political reasons for their actions um, that, that this would on a variety of dimensions crowd out those other narratives and um, and that eventually they would get lost and it would become just a story about the politics and I think that we would lose something there because I think that's and, and I don't think any of us think that that is um, what's true about the administrative state I mean it's a part of it but um, but I mean that's that's sort of where my fear is coming from. Asked uh, Professor Watts. Um, if we kind of buy into the fiction that agencies, uh, well, it seems we buy into the fiction that agencies don't make law just because it's kind of a necessary evil, but it's a very specialized area, just uh, we're kind of at a place where society really can't function without it. But for, uh, I'm wondering um, if we kind of legitimate uh, political authority into the decision making process. We're sort of undercutting the whole purpose, maybe, of the administrate altogether, that no longer they're you know, making these specialized determinations. If they're not doing that, why don't we just sort of leave it then to Congress to make the political decisions which Congress is just as capable as making as, say, the president? Mm -hmm. I think there's a couple um, responses to that. I think one of them is just purely functionalist to highlight the topic we'll be talking about later, which is necessity, that Congress can't do it. Um, so that's just the reality. And that might be tough to square from a formalist perspective with the Constitution, but it's reality. They can't legislate in every area and, and, and in any area that they would need to and that legislative agencies are currently working in. I think the other answer is um, a political responsiveness argument um, Mishaw and others have made, which is that by handing it over to agencies, you're actually enhancing political responsiveness. So if we reject the fiction and if we accept that agencies are engaged in lawmaking and that it is a political process and it is politics as usual, as Tom McGarrity said, then um, we would like to see it done by a politically accountable entity and agencies might perhaps be more accountable than having Congress just fix a rule that then is going to stick um, until change, which in our current legislative climate, change might never occur because of our gridlock. If we have agencies doing it, then we're at least giving some meaning to the presidential election cycle. So, you know, quoting from prior scholars' work, we don't want the presidential election to be a beauty contest. We would like to actually think that when you're electing a president, you're electing somebody that can uh, effectuate change in terms of the policy making and the implementation of statutes. So maybe we are furthering that um, responsiveness by delegating to agencies rather than having Congress do it. Well, thank you very much to the panel for, uh, for an excellent session, and I think it's now time for lunch. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.